So good evening, everyone. And we continue our story of Bilal. And uh, as I pick up what we learned last time, at this point in, in our story, uh, the prophet Bilam has already examined Israel from the level, the lower level of the Baal Plateau, the, pla the Plateau of the Baal, uh, looking critically at uh, Israel mode of procreation. And the question was, are they what they claim to be uh, uh, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What is their origin? And, and as we've seen, Hashem answered him that yes, they are, since they kept, since they keep the purity of the family life. You, the, the, the youngster get married while they are still virgin, unheard of in the Middle East. <clears throat> Bilam, then, uh, of course, he voiced loudly uh, the word that Hashem put in his mouth. So, uh, but the king heard only the voice, what Bilam said, they saw the Hashem words. But uh, Bilam in his heart knew that, uh, he, like the she donkey on the first revelation, uh, he had been given at the same time some freedom to, to think the opposite, to, to think maybe uh, maybe I can find some, some blemish in them and curse them. So his mouth was speaking the praise of, of Israel, but in his heart, he, he could, he could uh, deviate right and left as a she donkey did on the first revelation. Then we learn that uh, the, the Bilam and the king climbed up on the second higher level the scout field, if you remember, from where uh, Bilam could examine Israel's faith. Now, are, are they really indeed so loyal to Hashem as they claim to be? And as before, Hashem put words in, in Bilam's mouth and saying, yes, they are. Uh, Israel faith, they are, is pure. Israel faith is pure and sincere, and they do believe in the Shema. We remember that section actually was placed in Shema one time, and they recite it twice a day, the Shema, and they even throw and thrown God on Rosh Hashanah. We heard the voice of the blowing of the shofar and the trumpet of Rosh Hashanah. So they they believe in Hashem and His kingship. Uh, uh, their face is pure. And here again, uh, Bilam voiced loudly the word that Hashem told him to say, but in his heart, he still had some freedom to deviate and to think maybe I can find a blemish from that. The freedom was, that it was given was less than on the first lower level, but still he had the leverage, some leverage to go at least forward and, uh, and find some uh, blemish in them or create a blemish in them. <clears throat> now, uh, Bilam was ready to climb up on the highest level of the head of Peor and examine Israel camp. Uh, from there, they, he will ask, uh, are they really civilized nation are they real civilization or are they wild oxen and a cloud of locusts roaming around, uh, eating everything like King Belak claimed, presented them? Can, the question is, can they serve as example of a good society to all mankind as Jacob has pledged to do? Are these people while people just came out from Egypt like cloud, are they, are they able to, to present a society that uh, will be an uh, example for all the world? That was the question he's supposed to answer. And we learned last time that on, on the way, on the third to, to the top, something happened to him 
to Bilam as he himself saying, uh, and I read it for you, the word of Bilam, the son of Beor, Beor the word of the man with closed eye, uh, the word of the one who heard the, the word of El, who see the vision of Shaddai, while fallen with open eye, while fallen and with open eye. So as you remember, I'll talk about a little bit last time, uh, he was saying that uh, when, when he, was, he, he just encountered another attribute of God that we, we don't, usually we don't see it. It is called Shaddai, which means in Hebrew, Shad, Shaddai is a breast. There are many explanations. I will select the one that fits the story here. And many rabbis agree with, would agree with me uh, that uh, here it remains, it means Shaddai is Shad breast. Shad is breast. So Shaddai referred to God capacity as one who nourishes mankind. Like a gardener who cultivates and nourishes mankind like a plow, like a garden, towards growing a, a, a goal, toward, towards a goal. So Shaddai is that capacity of me, or attribute of God that uh, raise or cultivate people according to his wish, like a gardener. So, so far we, we summarized, we have several attributes that we know uh, from the Torah. Uh, there are many attributes that we learn from, for, we learn that God is a creator from Genesis chapter one. God is a judge Elohim who created the world for judgment, of course, it's chapter one. God is a merciful, he appears sometimes as a merciful attribute you, you by HVH. Uh, who formed to, along with Elohim, the heavenly court. So the mercy and joy in judgment, we learn that. He, uh, God is also the king of the universe, who lived the history. God is the owner of the heaven and the earth, as Abraham perceived it, Adonai. And now we learn that God is also Shaddai, a gardener, who cultivates and nourishes mankind to raise righteous people. Not only Messiah, righteous people. Bilam saw Shaddai examining people, semen and eggs, looking for the drop from where righteous person will rise. That's, that's a vision he had. Uh, to Bilam, and to Bilam, great surprise, such a drop was found embedded in King Zbalak himself. This guy across of him, of him in, uh, on the mountain, who stood there, who, who is arch enemy of Israel. So uh, such a drop, Bilam realized, of a righteous, potential righteous person, lies in Balak, King Valak belly. So that revelation re, uh, is, is stunned him. He, he burst in laughter, uh, for which we learn he lost his eye. Now, now the, let's point out that seeing Shaddai at that point in the story meant that from now on, on the third revelation, uh, Bilam would see how Shaddai cultivates mankind to produce righteous person. So it's not incidental that the revelation of Shaddai came here to Bilam just on, before the third level, as he about to see Israel camp. And on, 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 on that third vision, he will learn how Shaddai works how cultivates people uh, 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 to mankind 
to to raise a righteous person, righteous people. Now, let's note that the, the name El Shaddai appear also uh, in God's word to Moses. When Moses, when God sent to Moses the first time to Pharaoh. He said, let him, let, I said, let go to Pharaoh and tell him this and this and that. So God is quoting saying to Moses, I am Hashem, why at the age? I appealed to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, but with my name, YHVH, I did not make myself thought, known to them. So here Hashem is telling Moses that he, he had appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and knew him, he appeared to them as El Shaddai, as a redeemer, as a YHVH, he didn't, they didn't, he didn't show to them because they didn't need a redeemer, but he, he, they need to they need to uh, to God to show himself as El Shaddai. Why? Because what every time Hashem appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he promised them that they will be fruitful, multiply, and they will become father of many tribes and kings. So El Shaddai is the one who nourishes and cultivates mankind to, right, to raise righteous people uh, according to his wish. So it's not incidental that the, the, the patriarch knew him as, a, as a El Shaddai because he promised them to multiply and to, 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 be, and to, to produce righteous people to be example for the whole world. So that's El Shaddai revealing himself to the patriarch, but now to Israel in Egypt, and they need to be redeemed, he, he appears to them in a different capacity. In the we age, it was a redeemer. Now with that awareness of his own mind, the prophet Bilam stood with the king Balak on the head of the Peor. From where they saw Israel and Terah came for the first time. And like before, Bilam ordered the king to offer seven bulls and seven rams and seven uh, on seven altars, invoking the seven commandment. Moreover, and like before, they, both of them stood there now in sincere prayer, which made a good impression in the heavenly court. They stood in, in sincere prayer. And that point is extremely important in our ascension, in our story, because it shows that Kid Balak, despite the fact that he was such an enemy of Israel, he still had the holy spark in him. He could stand in prayer, he could adopt on himself the seventh commandment, and even offer a prayer, uh, sacrifice to Hashem, to, as the prophet told him. So uh, he had a, a spark, holy spark in his whole, in his soul, if you want, that could be cultivated by El Shaddai. So that point is extremely important uh, when you talk about King Balak himself, who had, a, who had in his body a, 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 a drop from where a righteous person would one day come. So Bilam also recalled at that time when he stood on the third plateau, that during this forthcoming third revelation, he would have absolutely no freedom to deviate from the word he would say. Like the she donkey standing before the angel of Hashem on the third, third time, he would have no ear to crouch on the ground with total submission, and he would have no room to deviate from, from Hashem world right and left. He couldn't curse Israel. And moreover, as the angel told him, his mouth and his heart will concur. On this, on this third occasion, he will really bless Israel from his own right, from his own heart. He will not uh, 
try to cheat or to find a blemish in it. That's the angel told him. That's what's going to happen. And that was really easy, if you want, because seeing Israel from the head of plateau of the Peor, you, if, you co if they compare Israel face to the filthy Peor worshiping, Israel from that comparison look very good. Even in the Bilam scrutinizing eye, he's standing on the Peor and he's looking at Israel. Well, you compare the two, Israel look extremely good uh, compared to the filthy Peor. You remember how the Peor worshiping was done in a very filthy way. But this was the first point. The second point, by standing on, on, the, on, it, standing on, on the, this high plateau, Israel camp was perfectly organized, seemed to be to the prophet, perfectly organized with four wings, each comprising of three tribes with, with the flags and a tabernacle in the middle. So it was extremely well organized uh, camp. It was not, it was not the, uh, the, the wild oxen and the cloud of uh, locusts that uh, King Barak described. These are civilized people. They, they, can, they can build, they're capable of building a society that can be an example for all the world. So the, his heart and his mouth uh, concur. You agree with that. Uh, so as, he, as, he, as he himself now saying, and I quote to you, and Bilam saw that it was good in the eyes of Hashem. So he decided from now on, I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to say and think the same. So Bilam saw that it was good in, in the eyes of Hashem to bless Israel. So he did not go as, as every other time before toward divination but he set his face towards the wilderness. And Bilam raised his eyes and saw Israel dwelling according to his tribes, as we just said, and the spirit of Elohim was upon him, poetically. He de declaimed his parable and said, so what, is, what we're gonna hear from him is parable. It should not be taken literally. And he was saying, how goodly are famous word, how goodly are your tent, O Jacob, your dwelling, your dwelling places, tabernacles, or Mishkan, Israel. So what was he saying here? Bila was first impressed, he was impressed not only by the camp perfect order, military order, that's fine, but also by the tent arrangement. The, the people tents arrangement in the camp. The tent of Israel were set up in such a way, he noticed, that no person could watch and covet his neighbor's tent. Each family lived privately and in modestly, in modest modesty. So there was no jealousy. This camp really, this camp, the way they set up the, the tent, really fit. The idea that the Shekhinah dwell in such camp. Because the Shekhinah hate people who, who will lust the other people, the wives and so on. So this is a this is a sign, this modesty is a sign that this camp is really where Shekhinah can dwell. He was very impressed. And then he's saying, How good are your dwelling? Or Mishkenot, which is which is the tabernacle in plural. Well, he had only Mish one Mishkan. What, what what does he mean? He was seeing Mishkenot, many tabernacles. So the rabbi said uh, that Bilam actually was rewarded here with a prophetic power to see tabernacles. Even in the Holy Land, not only here, but as later on in the Holy Land, like the tab tabernacle in Gilgal, in Givon, in Shiloh. Uh, his prophecy therefore took him fast forward almost 400 years. 
into the area of Israel judges in Samuel time. That's how the rabbi made it, made it interpreted his words, tabernacles. And it fits what he was going to say now. And the society he saw there in this future uh, impressed him even more. This was a society in which the Shekhinah dwelt, where the tabernacles stood for praying, where tens of Torah academies were filled with, with children and people who study Torah all day long, the synagogue. And, um, and such, a, such a community fits to be the dwelling of the Shekhinah. And he continued to say in parables, stretching out like brooks, the garden, like the garden of the river, like aloes planted by Hashem, like cedar by water. Remember, this is parable. Water shall flow from his wells, and his seed shall be like abundant water. Okay, so what was he saying? The rabbi said, what is water if not Torah? So the prophet saw the Torah feeling, feeling the, the land of Israel. Is my camera stop? Your video has frozen, but we can still hear you. Oh, okay. I see, I see my, my, my video is frozen from someone. But the audio is still coming through. Okay. All right. I don't know if I can change it. No, it's on. I don't know what. Anyhow, if you hear me, that's fine. <clears throat> so what is water, if not Torah? So what the prophet saw a perfect, a perfect proper, proper environment for El Shaddai to step in and cultivate and grow righteous people, righteous fruit. Uh, you need, for, for good fruit, you need good land, you need to water it and to grow, to cultivate it. And man, mankind is like trees. And uh, here, what we were seeing is a society uh, anchored to the patriarch with good faith, the society full of synagogue, the tabernacle, the Torah. And this is a society that can, that the Shekhinah can dwell, and uh, El Shad Shaddai can play out his plan. And but let's make another point here. Bilam saw how the Torah spread out like brooks, like a garden by the river. The Torah is not frozen in time as from given of Sinai, but flows like river to help El Shaddai to fertilize the mankind, the mind of man, and, and to raise righteous people. Enormous, enormous insight. The Torah is a border. I repeat it, Torah is like water that fertilizes people's mind as well as body, if you want, uh, to develop, to help El Shaddai cultivate and develop righteous people. It's not just Messiah, it's people. People who are as great as the Messiah uh, because they, they develop. Uh, they have the, the, everything uh, according to what El Shaddai wants. And the Torah expand like water flow to answer the generation needs. The source is a written Torah, yet there is also an oral Torah that was either given orally to Israel by Moses or expanded by the sages of Israel in the land of Israel. So the tent of Academy of Torah, they, there were sages there that continue to develop the oral Torah. So the oral Torah is comprised 
comprises of what Moses said, traditionally he heard, and then from generation after generation, uh, the sages added, and, and the Torah, uh, actually the, the Deuteronomy in many places says, you should listen to the sages of your time. So the Torah expand to, to meet the generation needs. So how does the Torah work? How does it help here, the whole story? As if to answer this question, Bilam saw two, the two women now crossing the field between Moab and Judea. The women seemed to be very poor, wearing shabby clothes and walking barefoot. One was about 40 years old and the other was much older, perhaps twice as much. They clung to each other with love, making their way in the thorny fields towards Judea. The older one said to the younger one, my beloved daughter-in-law, Ruth, go back now to your people, to your mother home. I have nothing to offer you anymore. No money, no other son who could marry you. What can you gain by staying with me? But Ruth said, and I quote, do not urge, urge me to leave you to turn back and not follow you. For wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you lodge, I'll, I'll lodge. Your people are my people and your God is my God. Wherever you die, I'll die. And, where, and there I will be buried. Thus may Hashem do to me and more if anything but death separates me from you. So this was kind words, great act of chesed from, from, from Ruth. And yet, since Elva is chesed, because she was not obligated by any law to cross the border of Israel and support the mother-in-law. There's no such law. She did it voluntarily out of her chesed. The prophet Bilam was really impressed even surprised to hear that because he noticed that Ruth, this girl, Ruth, woman, Ruth, came from no other but King Balak, who is lacking chesed whatsoever. Moab, rooted in Sodom Gomorrah, lacked any chesed. That's why they're forbidden to join Israel. If so, wasn't Ruth the product, how was it? Wasn't root full of chesed, the product of El Shaddai, who brought her up through several generations from Balak to her, or if you want to start from Sodom to Balak to her, making her such a graceful person despite her origin. So, this is the work of El Shaddai. The rabbis is found here a link in the chain of generation between Balak and Ruth. Uh, they found somebody that can show how El Shaddai really works. Because Ruth's father, his name was King Eglon. He was the grandson of Balak. He was a sworn enemy of Israel, like like Balak himself, who invaded the land of his Judea and subjected the Israelite for 18 years, as told in the book of Judges. One of Israel's judges, his name is Ehud, he was a left-handed person, had his dagger on his right leg, down in the leg, and thus he managed to bypass the Moabite guard and enter the King Eglon Palace with a precious gift. King, I have a secret word of fellow came to you. He told the king so that the king stood up in God's honor and they were left alone. It was a secret word of fellow came. He then stabbed his, 
the dagger into Eglon fat belly. So he said he fell fatally wounded on the chair while Ehud managed to escape un unnoticed. Thus King Eglon, Rabbi said, died with a Lokim name on his lips. The rabbi said that as a reward, he begot Ruth. He was the father of Ruth. A voice came out from heaven saying, Eglon, since you stood up from your throne in my honor, and you die in, in my name on your lips, therefore you will have a son, sons who will sit on my throne in Israel. Thus Eglon was a link of good soul between Balak and Spoth, on which El Shaddai could walk and cultivate. The prophet Bilam understood all that, yet seeing Ruth pressing to go with the, uh, with the mother-in-law, he wished to tell her, st uh, st uh, stop. He, should, he, he wanted to warn her, do not go to Judea. Don't you know that you can never be accepted into their congregation? As Moses says in the Deuteronomy, and I quote to you, uh, an Ammonite, it says, or Moabite shall not enter the congregation of Hashem. Even the 10th generation shall not enter the congregation of Hashem to eternity. This is a rare, rare prohibition. Because of the fact that they did not greet you with bread and water on the road when you were leaving Egypt, and because he has hired against you Bilam, the son of Beor, from Aram to curse you. Ruth, however, kept pressing on. Hugging their older woman, Naomi, they reached Judea at the harvest season between Passover and Shavuot, which is a time of much grace in Israel since poor people from all over came to the field, flock to the field, to collect the many portion of the crop that the owner of, of the land had to leave out for them by the grace of the Torah. No such laws exist anywhere. Israel society was indeed the one that Jacob dreamed about, a society where the compassionate law of the Shekhinah we are part of the law of the land. So this, the prophet really saw that and he was in prayer. Bilam could also see the hand of Hashem walking chesed, operating behind the scene because as it happened, could happens accidentally, as if accidentally, Ruth wonder accidentally, if you will, into the field of that owned by Boaz, who was no other but a remote king of Naomi, former husband, who was oblig obliged by the law to marry Ruth according to the Levite law, if she is accepted into Israel. So accidentally, they wandered right to the right place. And Boaz himself, like Naomi and Ruth, was a man of full of grace and chesed. And in fact, the word chesed, grace, is repeated numerous times throughout the scroll of Ruth. For example, I'll give you, uh, when Naomi said to the, to the girls walking with her, oh, return each to your mother's house. May Hashem deal with chesed with you. And then uh, Naomi, when she heard that the Ruth wandered into the field of Boaz, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Bless he to Hashem for not falling his chesed to the living and to the red. So the, the, the word chesed appears so many times in its world. And, and when Boaz uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a silo there, and he noticed that the, uh, uh, that the uh, Ruth was by he blind by him on the ground. By the way. Uh, the law of Leverite demand that the woman would seek the, seek the Leverite man. 
So the fact that she went to the silo was not a sign that she was immodest. On the contrary, uh, she is obligated. This is a rare, a rare law that said that the woman she need to seek, go after the, the after the after the Leverite and to 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 pull it, pull him towards her to fulfill the to fulfill the obligation. You know she is on a, on, a, on a silo lying on his food, and he woke up. And he said to her, be blessed to Hashem, my daughter. You have made your latest way of chesed, what, uh, uh, choosing me, greater than the first one when you join uh, Naomi, in that you have not gone after the younger men or poor, poor age. You choose me and I'm older. He was like 80 years old and she was only 40. So he said, your grace, you, you came to me rather than to young people. It's an act of chesed. And so on, go on and on. The, the scroll is full of chesed. And chesed is stand, of course, for the angel of Hashem, uh, who is now ruling over the story of Ruth, the opposite of what Moab stood for. The prophet Bilam saw all that, as it says in the parables, his king shall be exalted uh, if, if I, maybe I, no, um, let me go back. How could Boaz marry Ruth, a Moabite woman? The scroll of Ruth says that Boaz approached the elders to fulfill his obligation at the gates of the city, uh, meaning the local court, and asked them to let him marry Ruth, a Moabite woman, in order to redeem Naomi Late's husband field. So they told him, he, 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 was wait, he, was, he was waiting actually to tell him, he was expecting him to say, oh no, you cannot do it because she's a Moabite. Instead, uh, they, they, they told him, you are lucky because just yesterday, it says that Moshe shown, well, yesterday or a day before yesterday, uh, the prophet Samuel passed by our town and taught us without referring to you at all. He didn't know about you, but he just taught us uh, that according to the oral Torah, only a male Moabite is forbidden to join Israel, excluding Moabite women. So yes, you may marry her. And then they blessed him. May Hashem make the woman who is coming into your house, like Rachel and like Leah, both of whom build up the house of Israel. May you prosper in, in Ephrat, and famous in, in Bet Lechem, and may your house be like the house of Peretz, whom Tamar brought to Judah through the seeds, which Hashem will give it to you by this woman. Ruth then married Boaz, and she bore him a son named Oved, who is the father of Ishai, who is the father of David. The prophet uh, Bilam saw that, and he was, as he was saying, his king shall be exalted over Agag, and his kingdom shall be up, upraised. The rabbi interpretation, the, the first king he mentions uh, is uh, exalting, exalting over Agag referred to King Saul, who really uh, overcame the Amalekite. And the, the next one, the king who is upraised, referred to King David, whose kingship is sent forever. Bilam saw how El Shaddai works, the formula by which he raises and cultivates precious soul like King David. He takes people, people conducting pure family life and rooted in the patriarch, people who also keep a pure faith, who build a society where Shekhinah can dwell. These three ingredients are necessary for El Shaddai, the gardener, to step in and raise a precious soul like David, the king of Israel, the author of Psalms. So that's a formula how, how God cultivate righteous people, and not only David, but many other righteous people. The Talmud says 
that the origin of David remained contested for generations. When David stood up against Goliath, for instance, King Saul asked the people around him, who is this lad? Who is his father? So a man named Doeg stepped forward and said, I know his father, Ishai. He is not one of us. He is a grandson of a Moabite woman who is not allowed to uh, uh, join Israel. Hearing Doeg saying those words, Saul uncle, Avner, 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 ben, ben, Avner, the son of Ner, drew his sword and pressed his family against Doeg's throat, saying to him, if I have your hair let for spumor from your mouth, I will cut your throat. Don't you know that this prophet Samuel has taught us that in the, 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 the oral Torah says that the prohibition refer only in a Moabite male and not to Moabite women. Thus, whoever denied the validity and the power of the oral Torah also denies David kingship, validity of David kingship. Remember that. If a Karaite or any, any like Christian or somebody come and say, oh, the oral Torah is just invention of the rabbi. So say, well, so what about David? The written Torah says, don't, no, no, no rabbi should, should enter, join the Jewish people. So if, if you're right, David is out. So, of course, this is not so. This is the, the opposite. It shows that the power of the whole Torah. And here comes Samuel. Samuel didn't invent it. He just came and said, he taught. He, he wandered in, 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 through the land of Israel with his court. And he, everywhere he went, he taught oral Torah. And he just came out to, to the story of, of, a, of a Moabite, and he just made a remark without even know, without knowing that the next day it will pertinent to Boaz. Actually, the rabbi actually pointed out there that had he came after Boaz, it would raise a suspicion that maybe uh, maybe he wanted to please Boaz. Here he came, he spoke to the people of town without any knowledge that Boaz would come a day, a day or two after that and ask for, for, for Ruth. And uh, so Samuel just told the truth, the, the tradition that he, heard, he had from all Torah. Now, the, uh, now this point explained why the holiday of Shavuot we celebrate in, in, on the day of Shavuot, holiday of Shavuot, we celebrate both the giving of the Torah, the both written Torah and oral Torah, as well as the birthday and death of King David. Shavuot is a double, double celebration. It's the giving of the Torah, oral and, and written, and David kingship. The oral Torah and the kingship of David are intertwined. The prophet Bilam now turned to the king Balak openly and said, I have a solution to your dream, king. Your daughter will join Israel one day and her son will rule Israel forever. That's what you dream about in your, in the, in the, in the, in the, your dream that haunted you for, for so many days. Aren't you happy to hear that? But King Balak wasn't happy at all. As it says, Balak anger flared against Bilam, and he clapped his hands. Balak said to Bilam, to curse my enemies did I summon you. And behold, you have continually blessed them the three times. Now flee to your place. I said I, I would honor you, but behold, Hashem is withheld your, you from uh, being honored. So he says to, to Bilam, to Bilam, go, I don't want to hear any, any of that. So Bilam turned to Balak and said, did I not speak to your emissaries 
which you have sent for me, saying, if Balak were to give me his household of full of silver and gold, I cannot transgress the word of Hashem to go to do good on the bed on my own. Whatever Hashem speaks, that shall I speak. And now behold, I go to my people, come, I shall advise you what these people will do to your people in the end of the days. He's angered. And he, he says to the, to, to the king, he claimed, and I quote, he declaimed his parable and said, the word of Bilam, the son of Beor, the word of the man who has lost his eye, the word of the one who has heard saying the L, and knows this knowledge of Supreme One, who sees the sight of El Shaddai, while falling in uncovered. That's the introduction, as he said before, Pompeius introduction. And he continues, I shall see him, but not now. I will, I will look at him. Actually, should I, I, I see him, but not now. I, I copy it from the book, but you should say, I, I see him, but not now. I look at him, but it is not near. A star is issued from Jacob, and a scepter bearer has been risen from Israel. And he shall crush the noble of Moab and undermine the children of Sheth, for if kind shall be laid to waste. The star of Jacob that he is seeing referred to the Messiah, the son of David. He would overcome Moab meaning the one who challenges kingship, and he will overcome the children of Sheth. And remember from, from Genesis, the children of Sheth, Enosh, and so on, the whole line, worship, mercy only, and not Elohim. And he will come the children of Cain, who did the opposite. Worship Elohim, but not mercy. Worship Allah but not mercy. So uh, he was referring to, you see it in our time, you might be still split along this line. And Bilam see it. Man, it's amazing how he said, he mentioned Shet and he mentioned Kain, as if he's back to, to the flood time. Now it is said, after, after saying that, Bilam was not pleased. He would not go home without his house full of silver and gold. Of course not. So he turned to the king and said to him, King, I have another solution to your dream. Do you want to hear it? So the king eyes lighten up. Go on, go on, he said. I'd like to hear it. Only if I get my compensation, the prophet said. Oh, you will get more than you expect if I'm satisfied, the king said. So here is my advice to you, king. You can destruct El Shaddai work by cutting off Israel's route to the patriarch and taint their faith. How should I do that? The king asked, still delighted. Follow your dream, Balak. You dream about your daughter? Let your daughter and her girlfriend dress up with their finest clothes. Let them take a basket of fruit and wine and go to Israel camp. Let them set up their tent among Israel. Instruct the girls to entice Israel men, males, and draw them into their tent, where they would serve the peor prior to having any sexual relationship. This will be simple in, in Israel's eyes, since uh, throwing trash and, and, and other things, filthy things in Peor face would seem to them not bad at all. But in fact, they, they serve the Peor. This way you will accomplish both. You will taint the procreation, the mode of procreation, the severe connection to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you have tainted the faith. The Shekhinah would then depart from them and they will vanish from history. You might even stop Ruth from coming. King Balak agreed wholeheartedly 
and to what, what is called now Bilam Council from, the, from there on, and send his daughter and other Moabite girls to the camp of Israel, where, where they caused uh, the, the death of 24,000 Israel men. Only later, uh, uh, Israel waged war against Midian, it says in, in, in in chapter 31, and also killed Bilam at the, at the war. And it says, for the counsel he gave to King Balak. So there is a hint for the counsel that uh, uh, Bilam gave. So Bilam was smart. He, he gave a good uh, good counsel to Balak to, to at least sever, at least delay uh, uh, the coming of, uh, of Ruth and the Messiah and David, uh, he was not able to stop it altogether, but his counsel is still uh, working today. So what is the Messiah? Here we saw uh, the formula, we learn about El Shaddai, uh, the cultivate people, uh, uh, mankind towards a certain goal, to, uh, he wants to raise righteous people, and uh, uh, Messiah is only one of them. Uh, the Talmud says there are many rabbis, many people, great people who learn Torah, who, who are great uh, uh, because they they actually fulfill what El Shaddai wants. So it's not just a, a prophecy of one person. It's a, mm. it's a way that mankind should should proceed on. Uh, to change. So the Torah is, is fertilizing our mind, changing our uh, body and mind towards a better future. Uh, it's not only for Israel, uh, it's for Gentile. Gentile play a major role here. And a Gentile just see, need to see a good example from Israel and copy that. All right, let's uh, stop here. Do we have a question?